EBSCOR, the experimental program to stimulate competitive research, is a National Science Foundation grant program. The goal of EBSCOR is to strengthen science and engineering research and education throughout the United States and to enable states like Wyoming to be nationally competitive in these areas. EBSCOR aims to improve scientific infrastructure in Wyoming and build science, technology, engineering, and math research capacity across the state. One way Wyoming EBSCOR helps strengthen science research and education is through student programs such as the Summer Research Apprentice Program, also known as SERAP. SERAP is an intensive six-week paid research experience for high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors aiming to attend college. It offers students a hands-on research opportunity in science labs across the University of Wyoming campus. Students work one-on-one -on -one with a faculty mentor throughout their time in the program. SERAP not only provides students with a paid internship and real research experience, but also helps prepare them for college life. I would love, now like to introduce Ms. Jolie Wynn from Chatsworth, California, and Mr. Jesus Yanez from Denver, Colorado, to present Near Infrared Light Activated Guanyal Cyclones. Hi, I'm Ms. Jesus Yanez. And I'm Jolie Wynn. And we're here to present the Near Infrared Light Activated Guanyal Cyclones. So, imagine being able to cure diseases like tuberculosis with light. So far in the world today, people have used chemicals to control biological processes. Medicine is based on using chemicals, drugs, and pharmaceuticals. Um, that's worked um, good so far, but we want an alternative. And that alternative is um, a tool we're developing called Near Infrared Light Activated Monocyclase. The guanocyclase act as a signaling tower, which can be controlled externally by remote, the remote being near infrared light. So why is light superior to drugs? Although unlike drugs, light can be shined on a specific area in your body, whereas drugs diffuse the your body. Because only light-activated neurons are affected, and most neurons in your body do not react to light, um, there should be little to no side effects. Light can also be controlled by turning it on and off in a second. So if for some reason you feel a side effect, you can just turn it off right away and you'll be fine. But if you ingest a pill, once it's in your system, you can't throw it back out. So you have to endure whatever side effects you go through. Also, it is not invasive. So no procedures or surgery have to be done because it penetrates deep tissue, unlike blue light, which only penetrates like millimeters into your body, which is not very little, which is not very a lot. But So in 2005, Boyden and Deseroff were able to shine blue light on a petri dish, and the engineered neurons reacted. Since then, they were able to engineer neurons in mice brains and influence their actions. So what we have here is a video of this concept conducted by Deseroff. So, since the video is not working, what would have happened was that a mouse would have a blue light um, shine directly onto his brain by surgery, and when the blue light turned on, um, before the blue light was turned on, it would calmly walk around, and when the blue light turned on, it would be hyperactive and run around. Um, and after the blue light was turned off, it would go back to calmly walking around, which would show that the blue light effect was instantaneous So back to our um, claim about a future cure for TB. Well, tuberculosis is caused by a mycobacterium tuberculosis, which multiplies and attacks um, all your vital organs, mostly your um, lungs, your spine, and your brain. But obviously, because these are your vital organs, the end result is usually fatal unless properly treated. But the weird thing about this bacterium is that it can lay dormant in your body for years, and just out of the blue, it would attack. 
About one third of the world's population are infected with the actual bacterium, but may not have the disease. So what we want to do is find out what causes the bacterium to activate, because we do not know what gene causes it to react. So what we can do is use our tool of monocyclase and put it in the bacterium. There's also a similar enzyme called adenocyclase that um, most pathogens have, but that's useless to us because, um, because most because we want to only control one function of the cell instead of all the and instead of turning on all the functions of the cell. But since most pathogens do not have monocyclase, um, you can control a specific part of the gene in the cell. So going back to our monocyclase, we can place the monocyclase, which acts as a sealing tower in the cell, place it into the mouse, usually maybe its lungs, and once the near infrared light shines on that bacteria, the signaling tower, the monocyclase, will pick up on that near infrared light, and the cycle, the simplified process of how it works to create a gene product, will um, continue. And if the TB reacts to that gene product, then we know what causes TB, and we can then develop a drug that prevents that gene product or kills it. But if, we, if it doesn't react, then we can continue doing testing. So I'm pretty sure this has happened to a lot of you. Sometimes you're in the mountains or in the prairie, even in a, some sort of building, and your phone just goes out. I mean, it doesn't turn off, but you don't have a reception. You can't call anybody. This is because the phone has a weak antenna. This weak antenna is like the blue light in the mouse. It is, as you will see in the video, the mouse has a blue light directly on top of its brain. It's shining onto the brain. That's why it's so successful. What we are trying to do here is a stronger antenna, which is our near infrared light. So because we use near infrared light, because it penetrates deep skin tissue, unlike the blue light, this near infrared light will allow us to control the cell outside of the body. So in this picture, you can see how the, there is no light presence. This is a, the phytochrome domain. And there is nothing being activated, nothing is being produced. But where we have the light over here, we have the phytochrome domain, and there's, some, there's a signaling molecule called cyclic GMP being produced. And this is because the light snaps something in the head right here to create the cyclic GMP. With this uh, signaling molecule, we control a variety, a variety of processes inside of the cell. So why do we use near infrared light? As Jolie mentioned, it's better than blue light. Whereas blue light only penetrates millimeters into the skin, near infrared light is able to penetrate deep into the skin tissue. And it's also harmless. There is, we're expecting none to little side effects at all using this red light. So how do we create the cells that have the antenna to get the red light? Well, this is a little analogy that we came up with. So this is Dr. Charles Xavier. He is the control. He knows where everything's going, where it's going, and what it's going to do. Here is the school in which the, the doctor functions in. And here we have the mutants. They know they're mutants, but they're not very trained. They can't do anything at the moment. So what this doctor does is gives them training and development. After the mutants have gone to training and development, they are now fighting machines. They can go to missions. They can help save the world. And what they do is they grab their weapons, and they're able to see if they win or if they lose. This is kind of like our construct because the doctor is like our near infrared light. The near infrared light will control where in the body it can access the cells and when to activate them or turn them off. The school is the phytochrome domain. This, in, this is what happened, and the untrained mutants is the guanocyclase. This one in cyclics, like the untrained mutants, has to be combined with training and development, GTP, in order to create the trained mutants, the cyclic GMP. This cyclic GMP is a secondary messenger. What this cyclic GMP does is activate the transcription activator. This transcription activator then grabs RNA polymerase. And what these RNA polymerase do is create the lag Z. This lag Z creates a lag Z enzyme. This lag Z enzyme is helpful to us because it breaks down a substrate in our plate called XCAP. 
And what this XL does is that it turns colonies blue if they are functional and white if they are not. If they are blue, it means that sufficient amounts of cyclic can be created. And if they're white, it means that we have a non-working volume of cyclics. Once again, lactic enzymes breaks down the X gap, and that gives the colonies a blue color. So we have two approaches to creating a near infrared light activated monocyclase. Um, we have two approaches because it's like performing replacement head surgery on a body. It's like um, placing a monkey's head and putting it on a fish. It's just not natural. However, in our lab, we have proven this worked for proteins, but we still don't know if approach one or approach two would work. So what we are trying to do here is mutate near infrared light activated adenocyclase, which we have a lot of into monocyclics. We do this because, as I was saying before, most pathogens do not have monocyclic, which is um, useful for our purposes. A previous lab student was able to change three key amino acids into, on, in the DNA sequence of a blue light activated adenocyclase into a blue light activated monocyclase. So which is how we know which um, key amino acids to change. And what we can also do is PCR, which is a method in which we multiply our mutated DNA. We create a special primer for the point mutation given. And what we do is take our gene into a vector and add our primers, polymerase, and nucleotides. All of these will lead to amplification of our mutated DNA, and which we will then insert it into our E. coli for a screen. The second approach that we use is called uh, CYA2. The CYA2 is a naturally occurring monocyclase from the cystis. We use monocyclase because, as Jody mentioned, most pathogens contain adenocyclase. So when we use monocyclase and we shine light on the body, it will only affect monocyclase, not adenocyclase. What we do is that we have our CYA2 and we are able to fuse it into our phytochrome domain by a process called yeast recombinating. We have the yeast recombinating on PMQ vector. With the PMQ vector, we use enzymes to break it down and create a linear PMQ vector. Now that we have a linear PMQ vector, we can then add our CYA2 and the vector into yeast. We use yeast because the, the yeast naturally combines these two elements. And now that we have our PMQ vector with the yeast, with the CYA2 insert, we're able to do a transformation and grow it in E. coli. So our results, um, what we have is an amplified version of the with amino acid change, point mutation change, 3 one 126 to glycine. We also have another ampicillin plate with amino acid lysine 51 to glutamate acid. So what happened was that our mutations came back incomplete. It didn't work somehow. So what we have to do is try again and combine these two plates together and also perform a third point mutation um, from aspartic acid 124 to lysine. And then our final limitation would be all those three constructs combined. For our second approach, using CYA2, we didn't find any blue colonies either. We sequenced four colonies, and we didn't find any CYA2 insert. Which means that we did have a PMQ vector, but our CYA2 insert wasn't present. So what we have to do is go back and do each combination one more time to see if we can find our CYA2 insert. So future applications. Um, Tuberculosis was one example of what, how we could use our tool of monocyclase. We can also use it later to study the nervous system. Um, the nervous system, the wake cycle, brain disorder, pathogen and host interaction, and cardiovascular disease. Our research is truly revolutionary because, I mean, just imagine a world where you can shine a light, pass through your skin, and you're cured. This is, this is amazing. All we have to do is create the cells, which have the antenna, and we put them in yogurt so we can ingest them, and then they're inside of our body. We then use the light that penetrates the skin in order to activate these cells. I mean, this is way, way better than drugs. Drugs deactivate activate everywhere, and they're, you can't take them out once they're in. We would like to thank our mentor, Dr. Mark Gnoski, our undergraduate, Rachel Schaefer and Jesse Henshaw, the Summer Research Apprentice Program, EBSCOR, and, and the National Science Foundation. Any questions? Yes? What could be some of the different downsides or side effects of using the, uh, the, 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 the We don't uh, we don't see how there could be any side effects, but we 
I'm completely sure that there won't be any side effects. I mean, it's a light. I don't think you can get any side effects by just using a light. And if anything reacts with the bacteria in your body, we can just shine the light and deactivate those cells, and they won't do anything to you. Any other questions? Harley? difference compared to like conventional medicine treatment methods? Um, or do you guys know yet? No, because it's really, really new. We're only developing like the foundation of it. We haven't had like clinical trial. We don't know the cost. So. If I understood correctly, this, you're presenting this as if it is an almost wondrous alternative to drug therapy. Uh, clearly, there are huge, very profitable corporations, Smith Klein, Sandoz, that are making huge profits from developing and marketing drugs. So, are, are they funding research in your in your area? I wouldn't know much about the funding except for the National Science Foundation, EPSCO. I'm not sure how this would work. Being a fairly new field, they will be active until we can more later. I, I would say that the, the drug producers 